Uh, there's been degradation of a, a few elements. I think it's. Uh, I think it's been more proteasomal. I haven't seen any large enveloping membranes. <laughs> anyway, the, um, the this talk. Uh, I mean. I've, I've had a great deal out of every one of the talks, but this talk gives me a, a, a really special pleasure, and I just wanted to, to say how, um, um, uh, you know, how important uh, Heather was you know, f to me for a long time as one of you know, the first senior faculty who tried to mentor me as a, <laughs> as a junior faculty struggling to find, find out what it was like to be a clinical academic. But um, uh, so I've known Heather. Her youth won't, doesn't make it obvious, but I've known her for a long time. And so, Heather, thank you so much for coming today and look forward very much to your talk. Well, thank you very much. And it was a pleasure to receive your email. Said, oh, Paul Matthews. <laughs> and so I really thank you, uh, thank the organizers for inviting me to come. Uh, I, I can tell my intermediate filament story. Um, I was a postdoc at McGill in pharmacology, and I was studying insecticide toxicity. And I was gavaging rats and chickens, believe it or not, studying <laughs> insecticide neuropathy. And after a couple of years, I thought, oh, there's got to be some other technique that's better than this. I grew up on the farm, and I thought I got away. And then I had this flock of chickens at the top of the McIntyre, <laughs> the McIntyre Animal Center. So I happened to hear a seminar by Sergio Pena, who was the first to describe the uh, Vimentin um, aggregates in cultured fibroblasts. So there's a GAN connection. <laughs> and uh, so I thought, you know, that's really cool. I wonder, and it, it will smell a lot better than an animal center. And uh, so I thought maybe I could make a model of the n acrylamide neuropathies in fibroblasts. So I went and worked with him and did that. And it was just a pleasure to work with. He went back to Brazil. I stayed, and uh, therefore I got to meet Paul. <laughs> um, so what I'm, that's my story. <laughs> Oops. Um, so uh, the dis to summarize the disorders with uh, neurofilament disorganization, we have ALS, and Jean-Pierre talked quite a bit about that. The toxic neuropathies, to which I just referred but won't go back to, um, and the peripheral neuropathies and hereditary, distal hereditary motor neuropathies, sarcomary tooth, particularly relevant to today the NEFL and mutations and, and, mutations and molecular chaperones. So after I kind of got away from the neurofilament field when you know, it, we all kind of fled for a while, uh, except Ralph. <laughs> uh, I started studying molecular chaperones. I thought heat shock proteins should be important because they're important for folding um, uh, misfolded proteins and either restoring their function or tricked, uh, getting rid of them through the proteasome. Um, and there are uh, mutations in several of these small heat shock proteins in CMT. Uh, the HSP 27, 22, 17. And then, of course, there's GAN, which I won't talk about because I knew you were going to talk about it. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, um, a particular ataxia called autosomal recess recessive spastic ataxia of the charlevoix saguenay much easier said as RSACs, which turns out to be a neural filament disorder. And then maybe have one slide on traumatic, traumatic injury. Oh, whoops, I'm going to use this one. So... Motor neurons and large DRG neurons are particularly vulnerable to these disorders. And that's because they have this, they're, first of all, they're big. Uh, they have long projections, both in their, den for motor neurons, their dendrites go up several segments and branch all over the place. Um, and both DRG and motor neurons have these long um, um, axons uh, to the periphery. Uh, but uh, I think it was Ralph mentioned that in the brain, there's not a lot of neurofilament in perikaryon dendrites, but that's not the case with motor neurons. They're unique. Um, and uh, they have a high content of neurofilaments not only in their perikarya, but also in their dendrites. They have these groups of neurofilaments uh, that you know, extend right up into the dendritic tree, um, uh, interspersed with uh, microtubules, um, and in the axon, Rather, it's a little different because you have little groups of microtubules and then the neurofilaments around them. And I had slides of these, but they're in my acetates buried in the cupboard somewhere. <laughs> if I have to give this talk again, I have to bring them out. But the other issue is, uh, is that, um, and Jean-Pierre talked about the nodal restriction in these large diameter motor, motor fibers and how something's got to happen 
to get through there. And in these diseases, you get these accumulations of the neurofilaments at these internodal areas. Even in our culture models, we get, we get that. So those are some of the um, uh, vulnerabilities uh, for that. So other principles that uh, I want to refer to in the talk um, uh, already discussed the stoichiometry and uh, identity of neurofilament proteins, their post-translational modifications, there are mechanisms of neurofilament assembly and turnover, and we just talked about how complex that could be depending on the place and circumstances and neuronal type. Um, but also the role of molecular chaperones, uh, heat shock proteins and other cytoskeletal proteins in regulating uh, neurofilaments if other things don't. Um, and the calcium, uh, calcium and calpane activation and cleavage of cytoskeletal structures uh, during injury or reorganization. Uh, <clears throat> now, neuro neurofilament dynamics also affect mitochondrial dynamics. Um, and not only just general exonal transport in, uh, of all kinds of things, but uh, in particular, in spe specifically motor uh, or mitochondria. And it's, they're very important for integration of cellular morphology and intracellular connections. Jean-Pierre mentioned how vulnerable cells are that don't have NFL, that don't have neurofilaments. And we see that too. If we try to microinject neurons that don't have NFL, you have to be very careful. Um, and I'll talk a bit about this whole concept of stability versus plasticity and structural functional integrity. <clears throat> so in ALS, I'll say just to, I'm not going to say too much about that, just more to make a summary, because Jean-Pierre did. The, um, this is, whoops, these pictures I love. They're, these were taken by Sterling Carpenter. And uh, when I went to the neuro Sterling Carpenter, I worked with Sterling Carpenter, who's a neuropathologist there, and he first described these large axonal spheroids full of neurofilaments. And in this particular picture, he's captured the actual connection of the proximal axon to the spheroid. Um, Notice all, this is the big fat control looking neuron, again with all the, the, the gentrophilic um, intermediate filaments and the dendrites. And this is a, a neuron on ALS, and notice that you have these, this dendritic atrophy. Um, this one doesn't look too bad. These are just little dip squeaks. And that's going to have quite a profound effect on the electrical conduction uh, integration of uh, synaptic connections to other um, to other neurons that are required for me to just do this. Um, we, have, uh, re -ex we have hyperphosphorylation of neurofilaments in the cell bodies and dendrites. Normally they're in a lower, this is the KVSP repeats are le in less phosphorylated. People say non-phosphorylated, phosphorylated. That's not really true. We're talking gradation of these things. Um, um, we have retraction of the neuromuscular junction and regeneration. They're having trouble keeping connected. Um, uh, the altered stoichiometry of NFL that Jean-Pierre also referred to. Uh, and re-expression of developmental neurofilament proteins, particularly peripherin. So it's important to remember that motor neurons are dysfunctional and sick before they die. I think this gives us hope because uh, there may be neurons in there, in that spinal cord or the brain or the cortex that are just kind of, you know, like, like they had the flu and drew the covers back over their head and said, don't bother me. But when they get better, they could grow back out. And I think that gives us hope that we could actually get some improvement if we had a therapy that really worked. Um, so, and how much of this might even be, a, a, you know, a pro trying to protect themselves is, is another way we could look at it. Um, we don't know, you know, that's, you know, when they may do this on purpose sometimes. Um, um, so, Chakramari tooth. Uh, this illustrates the point of neurofilaments and chaperones. Um, so, the over 30 mutations are, cause Chakramari tooth. Um, I'm going to particularly refer to the NEFL mutations that, that Pascal talked about and also the HSPB1, the HSP27. And if you look here where they, where they are, and here's trim two as well, um, uh, other HSPs uh, uh, affecting proteasome and protein aggregation, and also axonal transport. Mm -hmm. So uh, most of the work that I'm going to show you that's from our lab was done by Benoit Gentil. 
who uh, is an important member of the neurofilament family in Quebec because he studied both with Jean-Pierre and Walter Mashinsky. And then when Walter retired, he came to my lab uh, and as a postdoc and then research associate. And uh, he's just obtained his own position in kinesiology next door. So uh, he's a very happy guy until he finds out all the hell he's going to go through. Um, so Benoit made, uh, made a model of CMT2E due to the mutations in NEFL. And, and how we make these is we take spinal cord, embryonic spinal cord from day 13 mice. We dissociate it, put it back into the dish on, uh, on, a, on a substratum, and wait three, four weeks and let them grow up again. So until the motor neurons get big and uh, actually have a mature uh, complement of their neurofilament proteins. The neurofilament disappears, or the uh, peripherin disappears around week three. So then we're, we have the other four are being expressed. And this is how we model the N-hexane uh, as well. Now at this point they don't transfect, you can use virus, but uh, what I used was microinjection. Because I was trained as a neurophysiologist, and I had to get a gene in, I said, well, why don't I inject it? So, uh, uh, so we microinject contracts, we can mix and match how we want. It is an overexpression system, with the caveats of that. It is mouse, but I think it, you know, it's, it, it's amazing how well it can recapitulate the basic mechanisms that we see uh, in, other, in other models and, uh, and in the disease. Um, so that we get the uh, neurofilament inclusions, mm -hmm. uh, bundles, um, uh, and, and the soma starts looking a bit funny. It seems to kind of sprout. It's a bit weird. Um, uh, and uh, so another interesting uh, aspect of this is that heat shock protein 27 co-aggregates with mutant NFL. I'm not showing that here, but uh, but you'll find HSB27, and HSB27 will inter interact with, uh, with neurofilament. And, uh, and uh, Jean-Pierre talked about his model, where it's affecting the PKA phosphorylation site that's important for assembly. So we have a number of things going on. Um, the HSBB1 that was done by Schaefer's lab, and Jean-Pierre was a collaborator on that too with his mice. Uh, and, uh, but what Benoit found was that the, there were mitochondrial changes well before we could see these obvious neurofilament inclusions. And there was specific, and so first of all, the mitochondria became more rounded and smaller. So here's, this is, nor, this is an axon, these long microtubules, or um, mitochondria. And neurons expressing the mutants, we have these more rounded uh, uh, type mitochondria. Um, he measured mitochondrial fusion, and the fusion was <clears throat> inhibited. Uh, so, you know, maybe, perhaps they're disfragmenting, but they're not able to come back together. Um, and this also, uh, and also the transport. So they go along fine, and then after a few days of expressing a mutant, the transport crashes. What's also interesting is they get this new kind of phenomenon we call the wiggling. So, and this happened in the NFL knockout as well. So when they were stationary, they didn't, weren't just stopped. They wiggled mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and what that indicates is that neurofilaments are very important for anchoring mitochondria. And this has been known in, for uh, Desmond in muscle. Um, um, I think that was first described where Desmond linked the mitochondria into the Z line, I think it was. And <clears throat> And so that it's making, and another important uh, aspect of mitochondria is uh, their linkage to the ER by these things called MAMs. And mitofusin 2 is important for those linkages. Uh, so this was uh, drawn by Benoit to kind of illustrate the importance of the neurofilament to sort of anchor and, <clears throat> and help the mitochondria interact with their, uh, with their ER and other organelles. Again, integrating the space and integrating the uh, things that have to happen for mitochondrial physiology to, to be good. So if you can imagine also at the, the node of Ramvier where you want to have some mitochondria that they could be attached, you know, partly through the neurofilaments and then through to the actin cytoskeleton. Um, and uh, if you break this linkage, then they're wiggling. Mm -hmm. And whether that's partly responsible for the lack of fusion where that was 
speculation. Uh, we couldn't get a grant for that, so we, that was that. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so the mutations in small HSPs. Um, so HSPB1 has whole days activity. So HSP70 with HSP40 and BAG1 and all these cofactors can refold proteins. HSP27 can just hold on to it until others can deal with it somehow. Um, and uh, Schlafer's lab showed that, uh, that HSPB1 uh, can disrupt neurofilament assembly and actually cause aggregation of neurofilament protein. So we have, on one hand, a mutation in NFL that causes aggregation of neurofilament and sequesters HSPB1, but mutations in HSPB1 can mess up neurofilaments. So it integrates that they that they're somehow can act cooperatively. Um, on the other hand, uh, 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 Linda Greensmith's lab didn't find that change in neurofilament organization when they expressed these mutants in culture of motor neurons. Um, but they did see a mitochondrial phenotype of decreased uh, retrograde transport, deficits, and susceptibility to stress. Another study sh uh, um, showed, showed uh, stabilization of microtubules by HSB27, uh, that the mutant actually had more activity in that respect. So how those all go together, I have no idea. But there is some linkage between the neurofilaments. And this is just... Uh, um, uh, reiterating the Schlafer work that HSPs attenuate neurofilament abnormalities. Um, yeah, re regardless of whether, you know, the chicken and egg in the previous slide, um, if you can get attenuation of neuro abnormalities determined by a mutation in NFL by overexpressing chaperones. And it's a bit more complicated than just, yes, put it in, it does it. Uh, Benoit found that depending on the mutation, whether it was C-terminal or N-terminal, different HSPs were effective and depended also on whether it was a big DRG or a motor neuron. Um, but if one could co you know, collectively upregulating upreg chaperones uh, may have uh, possibilities for, uh, for treatment of these forms of Schorker marie too. Now, uh, I'll talk a little bit about RSACs. Um, we got to studying RSACs because uh, Bernard Bray, uh, who came after you, um, geneticist, um, they discovered the gene. This is a, an, a, an autosomal recessive ataxia discovered in the Lac Saint Jean region of you know, northern Quebec and Charlevoix down towards Quebec City. Um, <clears throat> a lot of genetic uh, studies are done there because they were, they were an isolated population historically, large families. Uh, so they were a gold mine of, uh, of uh, genetic discovery in the days when you had to do linkage. Um, so, um, and actually it's, uh, Bernard's um, has this in a peripheral family. So, um, so, but it's actually probably the most, com now thought to be one of the most common inherited ataxia. It happens all over the world. And the um, Ataxia Foundation uh, is sponsoring grants and has people all over the world uh, being funded. Um, this, this is quite an amazing organization. It's run by parents uh, who have two children, and uh, they work tirelessly raising money and, uh, um, and interacting with us. Uh, they're, they're very special people. It turns out that this is due to loss of function mutation in the Sax gene, encoding a huge protein called Saxon, um, unknown before uh, the gene was discovered in, in, uh, in our Sax. It's 520 kilodaltons and 10 exons. And it has a number of domains that, uh, that are important. The interminal, there's a, a UBL domain, and UBL domains help direct proteins to the proteasome and for, to be ubiquitinated. Um, it has domains, it has these Saxon repeat domains that make it big, uh, and these SERP domains that have a homology to HSP90 heat shock protein. It has a DNAJ domain, HSP40-like domain, and a HEPN domain. So a number of domains that would indicate it might be important in regulating uh, turnover of neurofilament proteins. So uh, the feature of this disease is, uh, this is, uh, is, is accumulation of neurofilaments in Purkinje cells. And Purkinje cells normally don't have much 
in terms of in, you know, actual neural filaments in their dendrites, as uh, in conjunction for what you were saying. Um, they label with neurofilament protein, mm -hmm. but they don't have this big architecture like motor neurons do. And, uh, um, and this turned out to be accumulation of this hypophosphorylated uh, neurofilament, uh, uh, in this case, neurofilament H. Um, uh, now, people make some deal of this, but that's how it's, what it's supposed to be in, in perikaryon dendrites. So I don't think there's anything that particularly unique about the fact they're hypophosphorylated. Uh, what's unique is that they shouldn't be there in these numbers and in this amount. So uh, what's happening with that? Mm -hmm. Uh, so we modeled RSACs in our culture model as well. Um, and how we did this was because it's a recessive disease that's due to loss of function, um, the Bray lab had made uh, sacs of knockout mice. So what we do is we culture the spinal cord from, uh, from these mice. Now, uh, I talked about Purkinje cells, and it's larger in ataxia, but there is a peripheral neuropathy as well and some cognitive deficit in people. Actually, Ralph's talk started, and the synapses made me start thinking a bit about uh, you know, what might be going on in RSAC, so that's a, it was a good thought provoker. Uh, so you can actually see the bundles. Uh, so we just we, we let them go for as long as they'll go. Uh, and actually, you can see the bundles, uh, these phase bright uh, areas. You can see them by phase. And they're just accumulations of pretty normal looking neurofilaments. And in these inclusions, there's NFL, NF internexin, NFM, NFH. Now, peripherin, by the time we're looking, these are happening, there's not much peripherin in these cells. This is just enough to show you that there's a cell there. Um, but their loss is a little delayed in, in the RSAX neurons for some reason. That develop, they're a little developmentally delayed. So we've modeled the major issue. We also have uh, aggregates forming in dorsal ganglia and sensory neurons in the culture, and also in patient fibroblasts. So it's very a bit like GAN in that respect, except I'm not so sure about the keratins. I, mean, I don't know if people we know that yet for sure. Um, but it's quite reminiscent of, uh, of the GAN fibroblasts. They also have, in motor neurons and in Purkinje cells, longer mitochondria. So you see these, in fibroblasts as well, you see these long mitochondria. Uh, it's like their vision isn't working. Mm -hmm. um, so here's the motor neurons. At three weeks, there's no difference. But at five weeks, uh, there's, there's uh, these mitochondria are longer. And this is around the time of uh, we're starting to see the, uh, the uh, uh, bundles. And it's basically just shifting the uh, length uh, uh, um, profile of mitochondria to longer, to, yeah, to longer. And interestingly, in the DRG neurons in culture, we got the opposite result, and we have no idea what that means. Um, um, so what about they're, they're accumulating? Does that mean they're not turning over? So Benoit did uh, expressed uh, GFP NFH in the neurons, and then did a photo, photo bleach study to look at uh, how and uh, how here's the photo bleach photo bleached an area, and then looked at and then measured the recovery of the fluorescence, and um, if if and what he basically found is that the, in the bundles the neural filament turned over more slowly. He didn't see much difference in, in areas where they weren't bundled, although uh, Paul Chappell, who studies the same thing in fibroblasts, he, he, he got that there was reduced turnover in uh, non-bundled uh, filaments as well. So um, what that means, maybe it's the faster turnover in a fibroblast brings that out. That's one possibility. So it's not that they can't turn over. They may turn over more slowly. but the mechanisms must still be there, is the conclusion of that experiment. Um, and so then how do, you fix, how do you fix a recessive disease? You know, in the, in analogous to muscular dystrophy to Duchenne, which also is a big protein, you try to define the important domains and make a mini gene. 
So what Benoit has done is to take each individual domain of Saxon and see if it can rescue the bundles. And uh, so here, here are bundles, pretty bundled in this one. Uh, the UBL domain works, but it kind of gets rid of the neurofilaments. Um, the domains with the HSP90 uh, uh, homology also restore uh, uh, normal, more looking normal filament arrays, and the DNAJ domain also. Um, And he also got partial rescue of neurofilament bundling by molecular chaperone. So by overexpressing, and this is now blinking back to the CMT and the role of chaperones in, uh, in neurofilament homeostasis, uh, overexpressing uh, HSP70, the inducible, the stress-inducible form of HSP70, resolved the bundles. So here's a bundle here, and and uh, and. And it was as effective as the DNAJ domain of Saxon was. He also exposed the cultures to celastrol and uh, had the same effect. So one of the issues of chaperone-based therapies is we really don't have a good drug yet. There's aramoclamol that uh, is being tried in ALS. But the problem with aramoclamol is it doesn't work that well in neurons. Neurons have a very hard time in upregulating um, HSP ex expression due to st following stress. So um, the chemicals that will do that constitutively, like HSP90 inhibitors, are too toxic. Um, um, aramoclamol is what we call a co-inducer, so you have to have some induction of the stress response already. Um, so uh, we still have a way to go to get effective treatments that are, that are, that are chaperone-based. And uh, another project in the lab, we're actually uh, testing a combination of HDAC inhibitors with aramoclamol um, to try to facilitate um, motor neurons um, activating stress response genes. And for other reasons, that, uh, that would be another story. Okay. So let's uh, talk a, bit, a minute about the, uh, the whole issue of the cytoskeletal linkage. Another thing that happens in, uh, in uh, our sex neurons is this eccentric nucleus. So the nucleus should be you know, a little bit off-center in the middle of the cell, per perikaryon, but it's shifted to the right. And what's happening, and what keeps the nucleus where it's supposed to be, are all these linkages that go across the, uh, the plasma membrane to the cytoskeleton, the, intra the nuclear cytoskeleton to the extra uh, nuclear cytoskeleton. And there are these, this has been worked out, there are these proteins, the lamins, are the, connected to emerins, and then on the other side, there's nesprin-3 and plectin, and then the intermediate filaments. So what happens in RSACs is this gets broken, and actually uh, um, nesprin starts co-localizing with the neurofilament bundles. Um, so this whole concept of having to keep, the, keep everything in its place, but yet be dynamic and be able to move around and assemble and disassemble. Now, I don't know how the cell works, frankly. When I think about all the things that my cells have to do, I wonder how I can even be here. Because um, whenever you look at <laughs> in some of these diseases like ALS, it's all messed up. <laughs> um, but there's also, the, again, the linkages of the, if you think about a, a fibroblast, the linkages of bimentin to the plasma membrane and then to the extracellular space and the laments. So all through tissue, you know, cells in tissue have to be integrated and stabilized with each other uh, and then inside the cell, the various structures have to, be, have to be properly integrated but still have plasticity to, to, be, to respond. Um, so what about calcium-mediated injury? Um, I didn't go into a huge literature search on this, but I did run across this uh, um, uh, experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis uh, study. And this, uh, they were looking at what happens to the cytoskeletal proteins after in this, uh, in this uh, model of uh, MS-type disease. So they measured the carbonylation of the cytoskeletal proteins, the microtubule disassembly, neurofilament aggregates appear, and then they looked at what was degrading those, uh, those carbonylated cytoskeletal proteins. 
And it was largely calpane mediated, which probably makes sense because this is kind of an acute injury type of thing, uh, with some involvement of the proteasome integrating NFM and NFH, but they particularly focus on NFM, which is similar to what you got. Um, so it's important to remember that increased calcium activates calpanes, which cleave neural filaments. And to link back to what Jean-Pierre said about uh, Walter Mashinsky's discovery that neural filaments are big uh, binders of calcium in cells that don't have a lot of cytosolic calcium binding proteins, I think can be interesting in the context of the, of the, neurofil of the motor neurons. Um, so how do we had a lovely discussion of how proteins get cleared from the brain, uh, but how do they get out of the cell? Mm -hmm. And that's one of our major questions here is, you know, are they just leaking out? Mm -hmm. you know, how much damage do you actually have to have before they come out? Or are they coming out in exosomes mm -hmm. or other microvesicles? And uh, in, this, uh, in this study, uh, they, they actually looked at the, they did a proteomic study of the um, proteins and exosomes uh, following traumatic brain injury, and all the neuro neurofilament proteins were there. So neurofilament proteins can, can be excreted, or secreted, rather, in exosomes. Exosomes can also bust. <laughs> uh, they don't stay necessarily as little nice vesicles. And they don't even, in the um, uh, um, meeting I was just at, they were talking about all these different little funny shapes of exosomes, and uh, they're not just little round things. Uh, and they bust open. So I think this is one of our one of our challenges, just to know how they uh, how they get out. So um, I think I'll just probably said enough because we want to move on and uh, exploring questions. Uh, how much damage do you actually need to get, or uh, do you have to get leaky, or do you just have to be reorganizing, and therefore you're your cytoskeletal proteins are going to be um, remodulated and, and their turnover is going to be faster, they're going to be secreted by exosomes. Um, what role do regulatory, protein, regulatory processes play in that? We've already discussed a little about what might happen under different circumstances and uh, the calcium dysregulation story. So uh, I really want to, again, uh, note my appreciation for being here. I think I'm finding it a very interesting meeting and really more questions I've heard at any meeting I've been at. <laughs> uh, so uh, to I'll acknowledge Sandra Minotti, who makes all our cultures, um, ben Dra ben Benoit, I mentioned, Miranda, and, uh, and another student, Michel Bayange, uh, Jean-Pierre Julien, and Bob Bailo for uh, collaboration with MICE and Walter and the Bray Lab and our funding for the, the um, Ataxia CMT by CIHR and the Ataxia Foundation. So thank you. Heather, thanks very much. That was great. Um, so now let's perhaps open this with questions, but let me just come back to you know, the, the excellent questions that you posed for everyone. But I, you know, I want to start this, this fascinating question about whether reorganization you know, alone is enough to um, drive release of neurofilaments or whether you need to do something that is more, you know, when we talk about leakiness, I guess we're thinking about some sort of more overt toxicity to the cell or cell stress. Mm -hmm. um, and what I wondered is what kind of experiment can you imagine would allow, you, allow one to dissect those two processes? You know, particularly I wondered whether you could reach back into your toxicology, whether there are any tools to, uh, to draw on for that could oh boy. separate that. Oh boy. <laughs> Let's open that one up to the audience, please. <laughs> You'd also have to be measured. You have to be. Uh, I think you could use a, a neuronal culture, as particularly as not one that's one that's more established like this. That kind of reached a point where it's not trying to grow axons and dendrites so much. It's kind of stabilized down. It has a mature neurofilament content. And whether one could try uh, agents that make pores in the membrane, and you'd have to actually measure the membrane permeabilities somehow, and then look. Or uh, somehow look for leakage into the into the medium, but it's, it's 
it's not a, that's not a trivial experiment because there's going to be stuff happening all the time, not just if cells die because you feed them, you know. So, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I agree with you. It's, I mean, you know, for the naive, it's a, it's a conceptually quite hard concept because you also have, you know, as you've emphasized, this, um, you know, really remarkable macromolecular structure that they're part of. So they're not necessarily like, uh, you know, if there are any cytoplasmic proteins that just leak out when you detergent permeabilize, for example, it might not act that way. Are there maybe other the, thoughts? Maybe, well, maybe there's another, the better way to approach this is is the measurement of NFL and CSF in serum with tech, very sophisticated imaging. Um, when, when during the, 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 the talk on the ice hockey and stuff, I was thinking about football players, because they really, you know, they're, they're getting smashed a lot more than hockey players. And there are studies going on on uh, imaging um, uh, football players um, before and, and then after they've, uh, and then, you know, if they have a concussion, coming back and looking at that. So maybe uh, uh, functional MRI, uh, uh, different imaging modalities will give some sense of what the amount in the CF, CF, CSF and the plasma really means. Um, and also deal with this whole issue of the, whether you need a portion. I also wonder if there are any lessons from uh, you know, measuring troponin T in, in uh, cardiac muscle. Um, Other, th other thoughts from the audience? I mean, I think this is a really interesting question. And it kind of goes back to, you know, Henrik's point about the potential importance of torsion injury in the TBI. You know, is that a phenomena of, of membrane stretch and change, of, you know, and what is it about stretch, for example, that changes in ion conductances or is it something, you know, quite distinct from this? Any other thoughts? Well, um, in turn, Whenever in the past we've talked about neurofilaments, uh, everyone, including myself, still visualizes this uh, peripheral axon with an extensive uh, lattice of neurofilaments. And uh, the first slide I showed of corpus callosum, uh, which is a myelinated axon and one of the bigger mm -hmm. axons in the CNS, uh, there it's not a, a lattice at that, it's, not, it's certainly not a structural uh, organelle at that point. It's, and you know, when you think of breaking that, you're not having to then disassemble this very elaborate uh, yeah. lattice. You've got uh, neurofilaments that may be very much more dynamic or they may be able to be disassembled much more easily. So uh, if the origin of the injury is the CNS, you're, you have a different scenario than if you're trying to crush a nerve and you know, uh, disassemble a very elaborate stationary cytoskeleton. So that would be uh, one point I would make. The other would be that uh, we always think of the axon when in fact, I think the metabolic activity in terms of turnover of neurofilaments may be more active in the cell body than uh, because you are making all of these neurofilaments and they're being transported out. And uh, you, if you label for NFL, for example, you don't, you have a hard time seeing any neurofilaments in, in a normal, uh, cell body, so they're either being shunted out or they're being metabolized, and I think there's probably a lot of capability to metabolize neurofilaments in the cell body, and maybe in the synapse, I don't, 
you know, that part I, I can't say for, for now. But uh, so, you know, it's, it's not as though uh, there's uh, this, this immutable structure that has to be uh, um, disassembled in order to uh, envision metabolic processes that would give rise to metabolites that can then get out. And if it's autophagy, for example, uh, the possibility that they are, um, you know, there's still the debate as to where the origin of exosomes is. Are they actually mm -hmm. multivesicular bodies that are late endosomes or are they amphisomes from the autophagy pathway? And mm -hmm. if, if they're getting into uh, the autophagy pathway, there are exit routes uh, mm -hmm. from that source. And that uh, would be another way to get out even without mm -hmm. injuring uh, and disrupting things. Mm -hmm. And most of these diseases upregulate autophagy as part of the, uh, mm -hmm. as part of the uh, stress response. Mm -hmm. So there's a ramping up of that whole process. Mm -hmm. And I always wonder why, when I read some of the papers on the neurofilament biomarker, they're saying it's coming from axons, and I don't know why that would be necessary. Uh, in fact, I think in terms of the periphery, it wouldn't be that likely. Mm -hmm. How's that going to see us up? Mm -hmm. Uh, so the other thing is cells spit. You know, when you look at you look at you know fibroblasts growing around in culture and everything, and letting stuff off all over the place. Now neurons not so much, but you know just binding to the inside of a membrane can trigger just a just a, a blebbing. And some you know, was it Pascal talked about blebbing? Somebody talked about blebbing. So there are many ways to have uh, proteins get out, including making pores in membranes and. So the exosome as a concept is very simple, but in the end, it's very, uh, uh, it's very complex. Pascal. I have a ge general um, uh, uh, question for the audience also about the composition. What do we know about the composition of the neurofilaments within the fluids? Because it's assumed from like naive person like me that it's peptides, so partial portion of the the neurofilament that are present. But are we dealing here with the, um, uh, a treatment with trypsin and other things that is necessary for the detection uh, in the assay, or do we really know what's in there? It's a, if it has been partially chopped, like it's known for like several developmental pathways, like uh, sonic HR activation, et cetera. Uh, wh what is known about this within the fluid? Uh, James, do you have any comments on that? I mean, the, the antibody that most of people are using for the NFL obviously detects a peptide from the rod domain of NFL. There's one publication and colleagues who did a mass spectrometry approach and showed that this is likely a peptide of the rod domain. But it depends on, on every antibody that is used, but this is what's known, that we are detecting the peptide, which seems to be very stable. Excuse me? Yes. That must be in the form of oligomers, otherwise it would be easily degraded, I think. It's, uh, it's, it's, I'm sorry, it's absolutely crucial to know that because if we just think about what, what people said earlier this today that uh, we lack of tools for NFM and H, so what is the cause of this, um, uh, this inability to, to detect it? Is it because the protein is totally cleared or partial processing or, or, t or just a technical point of view? Can I just follow up on that for a second? Is a more clinical uh, uh, and analytic question. So, is um, does one get a very sharp? Um, you know, is there a single molecular weight species that you that one is detecting, or is it actually a band of species? You know, oligomers down to peptides that are fractions of the. Uh, the total molecule.
Other questions for Heather or points to raise? Is a, so you perfect person to ask this question. I always, always wondered um, wonder why do we have like so, so many things behind what we call aggregation? Here, for example, again, it's massive. You have you know avoid mass, and here for the sa, I won't say the entire name. <laughs> It's, it's like more like, uh, more, uh, you know, the density is increased, but it's not like this ovoid balls. Still, the chaperone will act on the, again, I don't know, but in CMT2E it works, in, um, in, uh, in Sha Sachs it's, work, it, it's working too, but mm -hmm. it's different kind of, of, of uh, defects, so how do you see the chaperone are working there? But there's, there are also a lot of similarities. So uh, in GAN, you know, you have, you know, in, the, in a neuron, you have, you have more of the, the, the accumulations of the axon. In, in RSACs, it's a problem of accumulation in the cell body. So although the features, are, you know, the, the, the neuropathology is different, uh, what commonalities might there be uh, in actually how they form? Uh, you do it slow, you do it fast, you do, you know, you mess up one um, mechanism of, uh, so you mess up gigaxonin and you have uh, uh, your, your uh, E3 ligase activity is reduced. With, uh, with Saxon, uh, we're thinking it might be more of a template because it's huge, you know, it's, it's, and it has these repeat domains. So uh, what, what organizes uh, intermediate filaments really within cells? You know, and, uh, somebody who looks at Nevicho says, oh, they just assemble themselves. Well, that's, that's fine, but this is all regulated in cells, and they have to interact with each other, and it's different in different places, and it's different with microtubules, and if you get rid of microtubules, they mess up. Uh, uh, so there are many things that can happen. Um, so uh, whether it's because, you know, whether there's a commonality with Saxon and GAN that there's a degradation problem that we can't really measure very well, um, or uh, folding problems with a particular protein that either is an intermediate filament protein or an associated protein. Um, the chaperones have a very kind of wide ability to survey and say, you're trouble, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and, and try to deal with it until somebody else does. So it may just be that they're, that, that they're playing a central role in just protein quality control surveillance, and therefore they can calm stuff down. Um, and I don't know if they work in GAN. I, I, I'm just, I don't know if they did it. I can't remember. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I think it's their, their promiscuous nature, mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> they just love to hug misfolded proteins and things that shouldn't be doing what they're doing. Um, uh, that's the only answer I can give you. <laughs> but we semi folded, but there are so many kinds, we don't know exactly yeah. what happened, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And in the end, as I get older, I just want to fix it. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's so complex, I probably never really understand it. <laughs> we may never fully understand what fragment of neurofilament it is. But you know what? If the assay works and we can get it to measure, you know, measure whether our, one of our drugs works, I'd be happy. <laughs> Scientifically curious, yes. <laughs> That actually may be a good good point to end, but let's no, 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 let's all thank Heather for a really stimulating talk. Thank you. <laughs> now, people can perhaps stand up for just a second. We're going to try a, a, an electronic transition to St. Louis. Uh, this is uh, this is going to be really high tech, and I'd like to call on on Ross, um, um, who is going to stand in for Henrik. Um, so, uh, Ross Patterson is at UCL and is a, uh, a colleague of, uh, uh, 
of our next speaker and we'll act to introduce him and welcome him to the meeting. Great, yes, good, good afternoon. Um, so I've had the, the pleasure of collaborating with uh, Nico Bartolemi, who's going to speak in a, in a few moments uh, over the last 18 months, and he's supported us in setting up a stable isotope uh, labeling kinetics uh, program here in the UK. Um, unfortunately, Nico was supposed to come here, but he had a bit of a, an accident with his flight. Well, the, the flight was canceled. Um, I think we've got a photo to show you. Um, so, Nico is a neurology instructor at Washington University in Randy Bateman's lab. Um, he is a mass spectrometrist by trade. He studied in France, in Nancy, um, and then in uh, Montpellier, um, and has been in WashU for the last three years. Um, now, during this time, he's done some important work with Shahir Seto and Randy Bateman, uh, describing uh, tau kinetics in uh, IPS cells. humans um, using the, the stable isotope and kinetics technique. Um, he's also got um, experience in developing a very elegant uh, phosphorylated tau mass spec assay. So with this skill set, it would be very interested to hear his take on uh, neurofilament light and uh, what he can do with that. So I think, Nico, we've got you, we've got you on the line. I think I'm online now. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Hello. So um, I've, ju I've just introduced you um, to the room here. So we've got maybe between 20 and 30 people here in, a, uh, in, in, in London. In a, in a okay, hi everybody. Okay, good. So you're getting some feedback. Okay, so I'd like to introduce uh, Nico Bartolemi to talk about um, SIL. Okay. Yeah, but what, what I will uh, about is about the uh, using uh, a method uh, used uh, by, at the laboratory, and uh, Nicolas Bartini and uh, I'm working at the Bateman lab as a mass spectrometrist, and uh, since now four years, and uh, I will show you uh, as a, a little review about uh, the different application and results uh, the lab got uh, from the last 15 years about using this, uh, this strategy. You can go directly, I think, to the third slide with not looking at the disclosure and support, and just go to the yeah, principle of stable isotope kinetics. The initial idea, uh, when Randy started this project uh, before 2006 and uh, publishing this uh, results in Nature Medicine, the initial idea was to monitor the protein kinetics in, in vivo in humans. We have to uh, I mean, I mean, get uh, a level administrative into the, the participant. And to do so, we are administrating a labeled amino acid. And uh, in uh, the first application, it was labeled the sign with uh, actually ADC13, uh, which could be differentiated from the natural one by mass spectrometry. The protein will incorporate the labeled amino acid, and then the mass spectrometry can uh, figure out uh, the incorporation rate. And uh, when you look on the right, uh, at the extreme right of the slide, you can see the, 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 the incorporation of the labeled the sign first in the plasma, then in the CSF with the tiny delay. And when you look at the protein, which is the, the, at the bottom right, uh, you can see the increasing, then the decreasing of the incorporation of the label into the CSF, in that case for a beta. And the initial idea was uh, looking at the increasing when we get the synthesis, the synthesis rate of the protein, and the decrease at the decreasing when we look at the clearance of the protein. And uh, that's uh, for the slide number four now. Uh, the first application was in uh, a beta, to monitor a beta. Uh, a beta actually is the product of the APP cleavage. APP is the transponderone. Protein is when you label the, the protein, the APT will be will go to the transmembrane domain, and the beta secretase and gamma secretase will generate the a beta peptide, and you can monitor the le sign incorporated at this time. And uh, for the next slide, it's, uh, yeah, uh, obviously we cannot we can uh, also monitor different other kind of protein. Uh, we started with uh, A beta, 
but uh, then uh, it was the same method was applied to FOE, and now we are working on Tau, and at the same time, uh, uh, Tila is uh, studying the SOD1, to, uh, which is a protein, it is some uh, implication uh, in the ALS, and Paul Kovbauer, uh, which is who is working on uh, Parkinson's disease, is uh, studying the alpha cyclin uh, kinetic. And you can see, depending on the half life of the protein, uh, you, the, the kind of protein, is, uh, you can have protein having a short half life as a beta, and, uh, and a soft protein having really long half life. And depending on the half life of the protein, that is the slide number six, uh, we have to adapt the, uh, the protocol to first level the protein, but uh, more importantly, to sample uh, the, the biofluid. Uh, and uh, the, the first application of monitoring uh, by silk uh, long half life protein was uh, published in 2016 by a uh, by a team health group uh, using the facility on in the, the Bateman lab. And uh, actually, uh, we are sampling two data points over the over months. And uh, the same protocol was used for TAR in, uh, in that group. Seven, the same number seven. When you, you can see uh, on the left, uh, the, the top panel, uh, the still the A beta, the A beta uh, kinetic. And you compare to the tau kinetic, the scale, uh, I made a mistake actually for A beta, it's not day of study, but hour of study. And for tau, it's uh, day of study. And you can see for A beta, it's ranging from 0 to 36 hours to monitor the, the kinetic. And for tau, we have to uh, monitor over uh, two or three months get the, uh, the uh, 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 correct measurement. And uh, another uh, uh, issue when you compare these two, two curves, you can see on the y-axis, we are reaching 10% of incorporation for, for the level in A beta, but only uh, around 0.5% of incorporation for tar, which is the due to the, we are using almost the same protocol for introducing the level. But when you have a long alkyl protein, this label will be diluted over the time. And because of this, uh, the monitoring of uh, tau uh, in that case is quite changing because the CSS tau is a uh, uh, low amount protein, but you, you have to deal with this dilution of the label. And uh, that's the example in the, bot the bottom right panel. You can see uh, the signal when you have a uh, tracer to tracy ratio of 0.5. Four percent, we are really close to the limit of concentration, actually. And uh, we have that's the next the next slide to um, uh, design uh, uh, assay to uh, to really sensitive and specific enough to uh, to deal with this uh, really low low sensitivity for the labeling station. And what we are doing at the lab is using uh, immunopurification. And uh, together with the uh, liquid chromatography. And uh, recently, uh, I designed a, 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 a method to uh, use the mass spectrometry combined to uh, high resolution measurements. We have a, a mass spec platform called the quadrupole uh, ion trap orbit trap. And using actually we have three different kinds of mass analyzer. And what we are doing, and that's what I'm describing on the bottom. Of the, of the slide. Uh, we are isolating the precursor, then we are doing a, a fragmentation as a, a regular MSMS, but to get more sensitivity, we are using the ion charts actually to overfill the target to, to, get, to gain in, uh, sensitivity. And then uh, we can measure at high resolution the, uh, the fragment generated, which we are just targeting one fragment. And like this, we can reach a limit of concentration of uh, less than five atomon per milliliter of C or C attack, which is enough to uh, monitor the to, to monitor the the tau. Uh, the next slide is uh, yeah the, what, what the rationale of uh, monitoring a beta and tau by kinetic. Uh, you, you you know uh, uh, the the lab is uh, the primary goal of the lab is to figure out uh, the mechanism in AD. And uh, together with brain atrophy, we know that there is a beta and star aggregation. And uh, that's the next slide. And together, the slide, the slide number, I guess, so 
CSM biomarker in AD. Uh, together with this aggregation uh, occurring in brain, we know the CSF A beta and CSF per level are changing probably due to an uh, for A beta, the aggregation of uh, the amine peptide, which is decreasing the concentration in CSF. And for tau, the change of uh, CSF per level, the mechanism is quite in clear and uh, that's the reason why, why we are really interested to, uh, to use the, the silk measurement for time. And the uh, ne next slide will be uh, to present this, uh, different uh, application of the SIP method applied to the A-beta uh, kinetic measurement. Uh, yeah, as, uh, the slide num number 12 is uh, just uh, recapitulating uh, why uh, A-beta is uh, interesting to uh, to be monitored in AD, we have to really uh, figure out why uh, in uh, AD1 we have this A beta accumulation. And uh, to explain this accumulation, the first hypothesis were, were okay, uh, probably A beta is uh, more synthesized uh, from the brain. It could explain why uh, we have that, that much uh, A beta accumulating. But it could be also alternatively uh, an imbalance in the clearance mechanism means A beta remains in the brain because it's not clear properly. And the uh, next slide uh, is uh, yeah, talk, talking about uh, uh, the, the synthesis. Actually, a study was uh, designed to assess the impact of gamma synthesis in user. We believe the A beta uh, synthesis will be depend on the ability to privilege efficiency by uh, gamma by uh, gamma synthesis. Uh, the hypothesis was uh, okay, uh, probably by uh, applying. Uh, gamma secreted in vitro, it will change the, the synthesis rate, and we can monitor that by itself. And that's what uh, this study uh, was about to uh, demonstrate. It's, uh, we can see it in comparison to the placebo. Uh, applying uh, in vitro will uh, change the, the, the production, and uh, you have a dose dependent uh, effect. Uh, next slide. Another application was to, uh, feed, to uh, explain the mechanism behind something we know in uh, familial AD. Uh, before, uh, I would say that we know the trajectory of uh, A beta 42 concentration in CSS is quite different to uh, expect what is expected for uh, sporadic AD. Means we have an increasing of the CSS A beta concentration in comparison to control. At the beginning of the, the disease trajectory. And, uh, for the, that is the time number 15. By applying the silk, they, they were able to, uh, actually demonstrate uh, this increasing of uh, L beta for 2, uh, was, uh, the result of the novel production together with the uh, hyper clearance, uh, when you uh, look uh, carefully and you compare the, the silk profile. Of the non carrier, the mutation carrier having no, uh, A beta aggregation in brain, measured by P, or with, uh, or mutation carrier, uh, with, uh, uh, P aggregation. And you can see, uh, in the middle, uh, when you, put, you use, uh, the A beta 40 or the A beta 38 as a reference, there is an imbalance in the synthesis at the beginning of so the increasing of the curve and an imbalance uh, at the decrease. And, uh, uh, together, it was a kind of demonstration of uh, the, the change due to probably the, the, the pressing one and pressing in two, which, uh, uh, explain the, the familial ID. And the next slide, slide number 16, is, uh, yeah, about modeling this data because, uh, initially I was talking about uh, the fact that just measuring the synthesis and the, 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 the increasing of the slope and the decreasing of the slope to uh, figure out the synthesis and the clearance rate. But, uh, by, uh, uh at this time they define, uh, probably the, the, the modeling of uh, the structure was probably more complex than that. And they try to, uh, fit a model with the, the experiment data set and to get this uh, model fitting well with the data set actually, it has to involve different compartments, including, uh, uh, the, obviously the release of the A beta uh, due to the gamma secreted, uh, cleavage. 
we have then a compartment with the soluble A beta, and this soluble A beta is in exchange with uh, probably another compartment which is able to go to the this second compartment from the soluble compartment. We have a kind of exchange, and together those two compartments are uh, not this time in equilibrium. You have an irreversible loss due probably to the insoluble plant. And when you have this scenario, it's just uh, uh, reflecting the, the modeling to fit the, the data set. And uh, slide number 17. Uh, this time, uh, it's uh, the a study published in 2015 to figure out actually uh, with no uh, consideration of uh, the, uh, any mutation uh, looking the impact of uh, the amygdalis in brain on the simple curve, and now uh, they found actually uh, the presence of flags measured by the CSF for speed for T ratio was impacting on the overall uh, uh profile, which was, uh, as a conclusion, a proof of uh, an uh, unbalance in the data for speed kinetic. Uh, likely due to the exchange with the compartment of insoluble A beta and exchangeable A beta I described before. And uh, slide number 18, uh, another application and from the same study was to uh, be able to uh, look, uh, depending on the age of the participant, uh, the impact of the age on the different uh, A beta 38, 40, and 42 uh, isoform. And they found actually the, the age was uh, definitely as you can see uh, the turnover rate uh, of uh, the the post the isoform. And uh, next slide uh, it's uh, the application of uh, the same uh, kind of uh, technique on A beta, but this time we, it was really challenging because to do this in, uh, in the plasma A beta. And they found actually a, a similar relationship between the kinetic observed in CSF for amine, between amine positive and negative and uh, the kinetic observed in plasma. And you still have uh, a, a difference between the, the, the curves, but obviously in plasma, uh, yeah, the, the amplitude is uh, observed in a less extent. And the last uh, example on the, like the slide number 20. Uh, it's uh, about uh, using again the monitoring of A beta uh, to monitor the, the the effect of uh, sleep on the A beta release. Uh, it's uh, a recent study uh, from uh, Brandon Lucy. What uh, Brandon did, different patients uh, were uh, investigated uh, by, by being uh, sleep deprived or sleep induced. Uh, uh, and uh, normal sleep, they were about to uh, see an increasing of the CSF level of all the isoforms. And uh, looking at the A beta, uh, the, the A beta kinetic, they didn't find really an impact, uh, a, 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 a significant change on the kinetic, uh, able to explain the increasing of the of the A beta isoform concentration in CSF. And the uh, explanation uh, of the model is that basically you have a, a change in the production rate, which is proportional to the concentration. And, uh, and, uh, and this actually is, uh, yeah, it's uh, found using this combination of uh, data sets. And the next slide will be uh, some, uh, uh, presenting uh, the tau data, which is uh, uh, more familiar to me. It's uh, what in, involved in uh, all the studies. Uh, the slide number 22 showed, uh, first, uh, we, we can measure, uh, the, I was talking every, every time about, uh, the CSF, la labeling of the, the monitoring in CSF. But when we sample actually, uh, brain from participants, uh, being labeled, uh, pr just prior the death, we are about to see, obviously, the, the label. And when we measure the label, uh, the, uh, the TTR sound actually is consistent with what we will sound uh, in CSF. That's the next slide. Is, uh, 
il y a de, de first results of the tau kinetic uh, we, we got and actually when we plot the CSS data with the, the brain measurement uh, after obviously normalization of the dose and uh, also uh, we add uh, another kind of normalization about the time but I will talk about this uh, later because there is probably a delay between this is uh, the brain synthesis, synthesis and the release uh, to the CSS. We, we were about to uh, fit uh, to match the data and show it was the labeling found in brain was consistent with the labeling we found in CSS. And uh, to do the labeling procedure, we use uh, the, the, the procedure I described before for SCD1 as I was talking before. And uh, next slide is uh, showing uh, the different data we accumulate on uh, a dozen of participants, demonstrating actually for the first time the uh, average half-life of star uh, in a human CMS, which was uh, in average around 23 days. And uh, the next slide is about uh, yeah, the hypothesis now we want to test uh, with this uh, methodology of uh, star kinetics. We assume uh, since uh, we know the CSS star will increase uh, along the heavy uh, stage, uh, to, uh, we expect to see probably a uh, different impact on the, the kinetics. But uh, the, the mechanism will be quite complex because we have to deal also with the uh, putative accumulation of star in the brain, which we have uh, uh, actually a system with increasing of CSS star with, uh, an ex un with uh, due to an uh, unexplained mechanism together with a uh, star deviation. And uh, the next slide is uh, showing uh, the data we can get from uh, um, uh, from uh, a study comparing a dozen of negative uh, negative participants to, uh, to uh, amine positive participants. And uh, we found actually uh, when we look at the tra tracer to tracy ratio, you can see there is no really uh, separation between the two groups. But uh, the, the fact the the the, the kinetic of star in uh, amic positive and negative remain quite similar when we know at the same time we have an increasing of CSS star uh, from uh, mainly in amic positive participants. Uh, we are about to, uh, to, to uh, hypothesize, actually, uh, yeah, the, the, the data set we obtained is consistent with uh, an increasing of the star synthesis and uh, an active uh, release, uh, probably, uh, uh, specifically in amic positive participants. And we did not find really a re relationship between uh, the star aggregation and the iPad. We have really an association more related to the amic package in that case. And the next slide would be uh, yeah, uh, another application of the SIC. I was talking about uh, measuring uh, the kinetic of the proteins in, uh, in uh, human CNS, but uh, there is for TAR some global because uh, TAR has many isoforms, and actually by using uh, the protocol I described for TAR, we are just able to monitor one peptide and to monitor other isoforms and see how if there is different behavior between uh, 3R and 4R isoforms, for example, or phosphorylated tau, uh, we have to rely on the, on the, the analysis of uh, IPS cells. Why IPS cells? Because uh, we have uh, an advantage over the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the human. Basically, we can introduce the key more that we can reach uh, labeling of 50%. And together, together with that, we can monitor basically more peptides because of the star abandon in those cells. And that's the next slide. Uh, first, we assess uh, by looking the amount of each of the peptides we are monitoring to do a kind of differential comparison. And we found uh, a profile for consistent brain. Uh, the, the quantitative profile is consistent with uh, the expression of uh, full length star with many. Uh, 1N and 2N isoform and uh, 3R and 4R. In CSS, uh, the profile you can see on the down left is consistent with uh, a truncation of CSS star with uh, no uh, terminus. And when we look in the cell light, light 
une propagande de médias. Euh, Louis Sand, aussi là, propagande de consistance qui est de full and cell And media, we have a profile consistent with the, uh, actually, a mix of full length and a clip style, uh, suggesting probably, uh, the mix of full length is due to a really, uh, a really a passive release of, uh, the style from the cell to the media. And the competitive style will be, uh, really a style species similar to what we found in CSS. But we really, uh, feel off Uh, this, we use the, the seat method by the, 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 the cell. That's the next slide. Uh, and we found actually the, uh, labeling is different, obviously, between uh, the cell and the media. And we find a delay between, uh, a delay of over about three days between, uh, the, the kinetic, uh, the tau and cell and media. Suggesting actually the uh, this delay will be explained by uh, uh, a release on the text over three days. And uh, the next slide shows actually the monitoring of uh, the different peptides I described before, uh, because uh, in the, the kinetic for each the peptide. And uh, you can see in, uh, in the, the cell lysate, uh, you can see. We cannot really differentiate the, the different isoforms. It's quite, uh, quite difficult to make uh, this, this uh, video. And uh, suggesting uh, that the, all the peptides behave quite at the same way. And on the right, when you look at the extracellular star, you can see um, the increasing and decreasing is uh, not totally overlap between the different peptides. And to summarize uh, the difference, that's the next slide. Uh, actually, when you co combine the results from all the peptides, the, the different peptides depending on the region you are considering, uh, we found actually a trend depending on the region. Actually, uh, in, in intracellular tau, it looks the C terminus is released, uh, with a half life, uh, significantly shorter than, uh, the peptide from the, the N terminus. And when you look at the media, you can see You can see actually the, the delay in the, the profile. We can uh, find actually the C terminus is probably really before uh, the N terminus and the, the mid domain region. Uh, and the explanation of the differential profile uh, would be actually, uh, we, have, we are, as I said, we are probably full in the media, full and star together with some star. And actually, full and star, uh, uh, will, uh, contribute to the peptide, uh, from the C terminus. And this contribution is, uh, about to unba unbalance the kinetic in comparison to the N terminus in the new domain. And, uh, the only explanation of the difference in half-life would be the full and star actually, uh, has, uh, probably a, a kind of, uh, passive release, uh, mechanism when the The star is from the internus and the mid domain are probably, uh, with this three day delay, uh, due to an active release of the star, either the star protein. It was quite interesting to, uh, because it was quite, uh, again, the, the belief, okay, so if you have star in the extracellular space, it's probably just a, a passive release due to, uh, the neuronal that cell from the cell. And uh, the next slide shows uh, the comparison of 4R and 3R peptides. And actually, it's quite interesting because we, we find that like, this 4R uh, has a, a shorter half-life than a 3R. Uh, and uh, we know uh, in different therapy, actually, 4R are more related to the aggregation. Means, uh, may, maybe the difference of kinetic could, uh, could be a kind of uh, explanation for the different behavior of the square and the four isoforms. And the uh, next slide is uh, do, doing an assessment of the, the impact of the phosphorescence uh, on the kinetic. Uh, we were able to monitor, uh, in that case, uh, a peptide with no phosphorescence, together with uh, two other peptides with a phosphorescence on uh, 217 or 212 or 214. And so we can see the impact of the phosphate location on the kinetic. And we found actually a significant decrease of the half-life. Thus, uh, 
then the first version is on the 270. So that the first version could impact in some way the kinetic of the phosphorylated hydrogen. And uh, the last slide is summarizing uh, the overall results with uh, the mechanism I was talking about, but uh, probably a mix uh, me mechanism of uh, passive release and active release in the cell system. And uh, yeah, the, the last slide is to, uh, just to describe the, uh, the ongoing six studies, particularly we have uh, in uh, human, uh, because uh, we are still uh, recruiting uh, participants. So this recruitment takes a really long time, but for explanation, is to, uh, to have enough participants at the end to uh, monitor the, uh, the, the part kinetic in uh, more than one of participants. To test some hypothesis of uh, uh, the impact of the heavy status and heavy stage on the tau kinetic, and uh, particularly uh, the impact of uh, on the, the stage we monitor thanks to the uh, parallel measurements of tau regulation by tau pass imaging. And we have also uh, a project to, uh, to assess if the different tau passes as a frontotemporal dementia, PSP, or corticobasal degeneration, could have a differential CIP profile, and uh, we are recruiting for reaching this one. And uh, yeah, just to finish, uh, uh, an example not, uh, related to a uh, work done at uh, the, the Team Mirror's lab, just to show also uh, the, an application of the, the tau uh to monitor the, the drug, the, some kind of drug effect, in animal model, in that case, the drug is a uh, uh, RNA targeted therapy. In this case, uh, uh, the, the mouse is injected with uh, uh, tau antitrans oligonucleotide. It will uh, neutralize the, um, uh, the uh, RNA and uh, the, tr the translation neuron. And uh, we can monitor using the SIP method uh, the impact of this uh, neutralization on the, pro the protein synthesis. And we found actually the, uh, the, AS, the tau ASO is about to decrease after uh, more than 10 days after the injection, the uh, overall uh, tau uh, production. And uh, yeah, to conclude, uh, that's uh, what, what I call the, the the next slide, I call the positive side effect of the SIG study because I was talking uh, as a spectrometrist, we are trying to design the most sensitive assay as possible. And uh, in addition to monitoring the kinetic and the, the slide number 48, uh, we use the sensitivity of mass spectrometry also to obviously look at the hydroform expression in the, in the CSS, but also in the plasma. And that's a recent report uh, from the data lab showing actually uh, uh, to, they were monitoring the, the plasma in data set, but at the same time they were interested to look at the 40-40 ratio in plasma and uh, see if it could have uh, any uh, diagnostic ability uh, as uh, the CSF does. And they found uh, a significant decreasing in only 20 participants of the plasma uh, CSF and data 40-40. And uh, in the same way, we are uh, assessing a uh, minor isotron for tau, that's the next slide. And uh, we uh, are designing some uh, method to monitor minor sites of frustration. And actually, the method is able to monitor uh, five, five to six phosphopeptides. And we are using uh, this method to assess the hyperphosphoration in LD. And then we have a really promising result. And uh, yeah, to, uh, to finish, that's my. Uh, Last slide, I want to uh, acknowledge obviously all the participants involved over the time uh, of all the six studies, together with uh, all, the, all the people mandatory to, uh, to do this really compli complicated uh, experiment. Uh, obviously, at uh, the math tech level, we are just getting uh, the, the data. But uh, we know also it takes a lot of time and effort to, uh, to have uh, the sample collected, particularly we need technical coordinator. Uh, when we got the data, we, the, this step is mandatory, but uh, doing the modeling is really a complicated task, and uh, this pattern is really doing really a great job for that. 
and uh, we need also this long chain other biomarker and uh, uh, imaging uh, data from brain are really useful to uh, to uh, assess any kind of uh, change and uh, yeah and uh, I think uh, uh, I think I'm done and if you have uh, any questions if I can hear your question I will be glad to uh, to answer. That's great. Okay. Let me just check. Are there questions from the audience? Okay. Um, yeah. So the, the, the first, there was a, uh, a sudden explosion from the back of the of the room here. Have you explored neurofilament? Sorry, uh, I cannot really hear you. Yeah. Have you explored? The analysis of neurofilament turnover. Ah, uh, yeah, obvious, uh, since it's the yeah the main topic of the, the meeting, uh, we didn't have any method for NSL yet. Uh, uh, we don't have any funding to do that. It's uh, yeah, our target of a beta and tau uh, required already a lot of time. And uh, but uh, yeah, I'm sure we we have all the facility. At Koshu uh, to do the job, uh, we don't have the time and effort to do that. Can, can you just, I mean, just to uh, develop that question for a moment, could you yeah. um, walk us through first the stages in the development of the assay for a new protein, just very briefly? What, oh, yeah. what, what, what do you need to do in the first? instance to begin to explore the feasibility and timing. Yeah, I, I think we can, uh, yeah, by uh, thinking uh, the analogy with uh, what we've done with Star, uh, I think the first step obviously is to estimate uh, the half, as a, a world estimation of the half-life of the protein, and I guess for NSL, I will be surprised if the high flight is uh, really much longer than the high flight we found for NSOD1 in Tau, for example, which is already uh, uh, indicating what kind of uh, labeling and sampling protocol we have to use. And on the technical part, which is uh, really the analysis of uh, the protein and the incorporation of the label, uh, the, step, the mandatory step, I would say, is to get a sample threat compatible with my spectrometry. Means, uh, uh, in your good uh, in your purification method to work with, which needs to, uh, on the tau to reach this level of sensitivity, obviously, we have to default to screen a dozen of antibody to uh, assess the recovery of tau in the test. And I guess for NFL, uh, if you have already uh, different antibody, uh, it will probably increase the relaxedness to get a good uh, IP and then assay at the end. That's uh, for the purification part. And then you have the, 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 the part about uh, choosing the peptide of the, the, the protein. Uh, you have always, in aspect, when you do protein analysis by like spectrometry, you have always peptide in that good flyer. It is more sensitivity than other, which is also uh, something we have to test initially and uh, uh, to figure out which peptide would be uh, the, the good target. And obviously, the seed experiments restrict this number of peptides. Uh, you are just looking the peptide containing the amino the amino acid you are labeling. Means uh, you can uh, obviously use uh, peptide containing the CN, but if uh, those peptides so we really you are not abundant in your protein, you can think about other amino acids as long as uh, this uh, amino acid uh, has um, no, uh, I would say, um, um, you call that, uh, yeah, as long as they are essential amino acids, I think uh, very good job also, uh, since uh, the essential amino acid will not be recycled and will not uh, we are uh, uh, from other potential other amino acids. Uh, that's uh, another consideration to, uh, to have. And uh, when you have uh, the good peptide with uh, the residue uh, of the gas, uh, yeah, then uh, 
une yacht ou un client qui fait de, à Nantes hein, sur le côté de, de Biofluid, euh, il a retargeté, il est N9, euh, considéré de son utility sur euh, NF Platform. Donc, euh, avec I mentioned about Tao, uh, about the last three or four years, we were always dealing with uh, uh, the fact that we were always close to the limit of translation. And when we have uh, an improvement in the, just the generation of the non spectrometer, uh, for example, getting a new non spectrometer and being uh, two or three times more sensitive than the previous generation, uh, for the Tao kinetic studies, it's really healthy and uh, it's, uh, you have to consider everything like this. And uh, the kind of mass spectrometer you can use uh, will definitely depend on, uh, on the amount of protein uh, uh, in your bagel fluid. Because I guess uh, triple body ball uh, could be really sensitive, but to get the, the specificity is not always uh, perfect. It's, uh, you, you can be always to cancer by it. Any back chemical or biological background at the end, and the triple ball uh, will be not able to clear the background, which is something you can do uh, when you have a high resolution that's spectrometer, well, as we have uh, at uh, at Washu, uh, with the combination of double ball and uh, ultra. But yeah, there is uh, all these steps uh, and this technical aspect to, to consider when. Uh, May I just go back to the very, the very first step and, and make sure that I have, have it clear. So, uh, do you need, I mean, to achieve adequate concentrations of the primary peptide of interest, do you need to start with an antibody capture step? Um, is that really the key? I, yeah, I think this uh, would be really uh, yeah, something mandatory for you. But the, the question is about, I don't know really the, the, NS, the CSS NSA level, but I get slightly uh, higher than tell. But uh, yeah, it could really improve this, uh, this step and be sure uh, you have uh, almost 100% uh, recovery because you are using the right antibody targeting actually the the protein sequence abundant in your biofilm is probably one of the key. Because for example, for now, if uh, we are just considering, okay, we um, take the only antibody available, which is maybe uh, an antibody targeting the, the cell terminus or the end terminus of the protein, uh, the recovery will be definitely lower, particularly the, for the cell terminus. With the recovery will be uh, around zero percent yeah. in comparison to uh, targeting the mid domain of the protein just because of the truncation of the tau in the CSS. Okay, now I, 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 th I think I understand the, the, the basic outline. Is that, is that a good start anyway? So, Roy, you had a question. I'll try to translate it. Yes, um, into French. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, is there any way of estimating what proportion of the um, synthesized AD to or tau is getting into the CSF? So, um, Roy's question related to the estimation, I think, of the total intracellular pool size. The question was, what proportion of the total um, of protein being assessed makes its way into the CSF or blood compartment. Is that fair? Yeah. Okay. The, actually, that's only a question we can in uh, some part address by uh, the cell, the cell like to make media read. Uh, because uh, we can have an estimation of the... Uh, we will not really use the... Uh, like the kinetic result to do that, but really the amount available uh, in the different compartments, the line date and the uh, and the uh, and the cell. And uh, I think the the range of magnitude of the amount we cover in the media, and I think it will depend also on the dwell the dwell volume. But uh, I guess we are dilating by one more time 
from the cell to the to the media. And uh, I think talking about compartmental exchange like this, I learned now data about uh, uh, CS, uh, CSS to plasma uh, comparison of the, the, the total determinant and uh, the, the difference of dilution between the two the CSS compartments and the plasma compartments to get the dilution factor by a 50 time or 100 times which is also consistent with the difference of concentration we will find uh, when you compare plasma and beta and CSF and beta. But uh, yeah, every time you cross, you, the protein has to cross uh, a barrier, which is uh, the, cell, the cell membrane of the blood brain barrier, uh, yeah, obviously you will lose in recovery. So, okay, uh, yes, Ross. Um, okay, just making a point on the because that's something that's really important. Do you want to come up here so he can hear as well? So Ross is going to come up and he wants to make a, okay. a, a comment. Uh, yeah. You have to speak into here. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Nico. Yeah, so I was just going to make a comment about, about the precursor pool issue. And that is something that's bothered us. And one thing we're proposing to do in our first silk study is to um, label people with normal pressure hydrocephalus and um, when we uh, put the drain in, we propose to do a brain biopsy so that we can actually have some tissue to get a, a good idea of the, the intracellular uh, leucine concentration, so we'll have a much better idea of the, of the precursor pool. And then in response to, well, the, the other thing will be to look at the, ideally look at the intracellular fluid, if we can get some microdialysis data, ventricular CSF, oh. lumbar CSF, and actually get a real sense of what happens in these different compartments. Okay. Did you say intracellular fluid or sorry, extracellular? Okay. Um, that, that's a very exciting experiment because in fact you're also providing um, an acute insult that will release neurofilament. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now uh, Jean Pierre, you have, a, you have a question. Do you want to just ask okay. it? Or, uh, well, my question is very simple. Uh, what what happens if the uh, half life of the protein of neurofilaments? We know it's going to be extremely long half life. So the C14, uh, C13 may just get in, and that's it. <laughs> will, will you get be able to pick up something? You have to wait one year to to do the analysis. You know that's uh, yeah. That that could be a problem for neurofilaments. Yeah, that's uh, basically uh, a major drawback uh, because we have really uh, an alternative view of uh, really the, the biomarker we are uh, lo looking in the biofilm. But uh, to get this alternative view, yeah, there is uh, uh, just uh, the, the recruitment part, the, the doing the experiment by itself, accumulating enough participant data to be able to compare. The throughput is uh, yeah one of the time less than uh, just looking at one data point from a uh, question of uh, CSF and uh, getting a CSF analysis for sure. You have uh, you, you have a major limitation here, but uh, I, I think it is worth it because uh, yeah, for sure by looking at all the different uh, uh, I would say. Uh, theoretical uh, question we had on a data uh, we were not uh, addressable by just looking at the absolute concentration. Uh, uh, I think uh, yeah, the kinetic really helps. But if you really want to uh, get uh, uh, yeah, the data uh, and then make some, uh, I would say, some uh, understanding at the time you are some sampling and collecting participants, I would really suggest you yeah, to work at the same time on cells because uh, you can get data more quickly. And that's, uh, I think, uh, a, good, uh, a good way to, to work on both uh, uh, when you start uh, to target the uh, new biomarker. So, so uh, this is Ralph Nixon. Uh, I so referring back to your study of the, I think it was the IPSC uh, and 
uh, you found a comparable rate of uh, turnover of tau in the cells and in the extracellular uh, medium. And I wondered if you found that surprising that the extracellular medium would have such a, a similar capability uh, for turnover as the intracellular um, uh, capability. Um, you, you mean, um, yeah, when uh, you, you compare the other slide between the uh, leg base and the uh, intracellular cell? Yes. Yeah, and, uh, five I, days I, or something. Yeah, I, I think yeah, it's quite uh, yeah, in that, that case was quite interesting to really uh, uh, be able to uh, yeah to show the short me mechanism and uh, be a uh, be a uh, even if to, to me uh, the cell system is not really totally reflecting what happens really in the CNS because uh, as I say. Uh, uh, in CSS, we don't expect any full star, but something you, you can get in the, in the media actually, because you have actually a uh, weak uh, uh, mechanism due to the cell death, you will not have really in your central nervous system. But, uh, I, I, yeah, I think to, um, uh, uh, in, 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 yeah, in the case, uh, I think this, uh, yeah, those compounds are useful, and uh, I, I didn't mention the, the, the fact that we, uh, the, the next step would be also to monitor the, uh, because we monitor the, the, the hydrofoil in the light light because right now they are the more and more at the media. But the uh, uh, next step of course is really to look also in the media, the minor hydrofoil and uh, the phosphorylation of the 3 and 4 4 peptide compiler to a PR actually for the kinetics in the, of this hydroform to be also a change when you compare uh, the exact and media. Just because uh, the, 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 those particular hydroforms will be differently when they will be released from the cell. And uh, maybe to expect some of the 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 difference we can see uh, when you compare the PTN, uh, for, example, for example, the phosphorylation profile of the brain looks quite different than the phosphorylation profile of tau in the CSS. And uh, if this phosphorylation profile is affected by the release mechanism, uh, we expect probably to see that also as well in cell. And that's uh, what we are assessing right now. Well, listen, Nico, thank you very much. It's been uh, I'm, I'm, You're welcome. I'm very, it's been Thank you for, your, for your patience, uh, but that was a technical issue, but uh, it's a uh, great to, to make it. <laughs> no, it was, very, it was a very useful way of, of um, closing the session. I, I also want to thank you for the, uh, the really extraordinary effort you've gone to to uh, try to join us. I'm, I'm sorry that your flight yesterday was, um, uh, was so troubled. Um, We'll, I'll be in touch with you over the weekend to make sure that your final expenses are taken care of and, and so on. Um, okay. We're very grateful that you took the time. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Bye bye. 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 Okay. So, are you playing, uh, paying for the uh, plane repair? <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, fortunately not, nor for the fines that someone is going to have to pay for being in the wrong space at the wrong time. Listen, it's, it's, been, a, uh, it's been a long day. There'll probably be, uh, for those, uh, for the speakers, we can carry on some discussions uh, over dinner. Uh, there is some uh, remaining wine outside, uh, which uh, is best to finish. The other thing is for those who uh, aren't rushing immediately away from the area, um, uh, the v &A is open late tonight uh, till 10, and not only can one go in, um, uh, British museums are all for free. Uh, you can walk in from the street, uh, there are more drinks there in the v &A. but 
for those staying on for dinner, the speakers, um, it's the, the gore is on the other side of the campus. So basically, the easy way of going from your hotel is to go across the front of the Natural History Museum, one street over, turn right, and then come on up past the college, and the gore will be there. And it's at 7.45. So let me thank, thank you all, but before we go, I just wanted to pay <coughs> tribute to the, the person who really made it all happen, whose phone, you know, demonstrated by the <laughs> phone being held hostage up here, is, is Jennifer, uh, uh, Jennifer Podesta. Jennifer, thank you so much for all the hard work. <laughs>